fun. This is so fun. Um, as Erin said, we've been talking about this and praying about this, and we're so excited to see you. And I feel like we're just going to grow, that this is going to become such a fun, great time for us to spend together. Now, everyone was in their groups discussing tonight good stuff. Great stuff, right? Well, um, I feel like I should start by saying my name is Stacy Thacker, and I will be your tour guide into the wilderness as we start. Um, my girls all play with Barbies, and I can just hear myself saying, Hi, I'm, I'm tour guide Barbie, or tour guide Barbie, or <laughs> something like that that didn't come out. But anyway, I'm going to be your tour guide as we get started tonight. Um, we're going to be looking back, and we're going to be looking forward as we go into the book of Exodus. Now, we're um, starting this journey, and I couldn't help but remember the last time I was in Exodus. Um, was 16 years ago. Now, I don't always remember when I'm in a book, and I don't always remember when I teach a book. Like, I'm not, I don't have that great of a memory, but I remember Exodus because I started Exodus in Bloomington, Indiana, and I finished Exodus in Orlando, Florida. So literally in the middle of Exodus, I made an Exodus to come to Florida. My husband, um, had been looking for a job, and he was offered a position um, at Campus Crusade for Christ, which is now called the Crew, and he was offered a position for one year. And I remember as he was, we were discussing this and talking with the man who offered him the job, he said, he said, okay, it's one year. And I said to this man, I said, so what do we do after that year? Like, what do we do if the job is over? And he said to me, he said, Stacy. He said, sometimes you have to come by faith. And so we packed up our little Emma, who was three, my oldest. I was pregnant with Abby. I was eight months pregnant when we moved in that exodus. And so the one-year job turned into a 15-year job. Um, my husband left um, crew last spring. And so we are kind of in the middle of our own new kind of wilderness experience as well. And I was thinking about... The statement that that man made to me, that a year turned into 15, and God said, just come by faith. And literally, had we not doing, had we not done that, I would not be standing here tonight. And so, as I was praying, I was like, Lord, why am I studying Exodus? What is it you have for me? And the two things that the Lord said to me is, number one, I want to grow your faith again. And I want you to remember my faithfulness 16 years ago when you moved to a city and a place you did not know. I knew no one. I didn't even know First Baptist Orlando existed. And I led you to a church community, and here you are among these amazing people, and God has done such a work in our lives since that time, and I want you to remember. And as we go through Exodus, one of the things that you're gonna hear a lot is remember, remember. We're gonna hear that over and over again. This is a theme in Israel's life that they were to remember. And so for me personally, I know that that's what God is stirring up in my heart. So I don't know if you all have prayed about it or thought about it, but I just love this week as you're digging back into Exodus, just to ask God, what is it you have for me? And just continually ask him that. And it, you may not know until the end. I certainly, in the middle of our Exodus, coming from Indiana to Orlando, didn't know what God was going to do. But it's really neat to look back on that time at this point and know. So I am excited to be back in Exodus. Now we um, are <laughs> dropping into Exodus kind of in the middle of the story. And so tonight, um, the other kind of funny thing is I had asked Aaron early on, like, how much time do you want teaching? Like, how much teaching time do you, do you want us to need a plan for? And she's like, oh, about 30 minutes. And I was like, whoa, we got a lot to cover tonight. I just feel like there's a lot to cover. And so I was like really trying to pack it into 30. And, um, and then later in the week, Aaron started planning her talk for next week. And she messaged me and she said, maybe a little more than 30 is <laughs> fine. So we're saying 30-ish tonight. And so I make no guarantees about where we'll land because what I wanna do is I wanna do a little context work. I want us to kind of go look back a little bit at what has been happening in the book of Exodus because we're dropping in in chapter 12 and so much has happened already. And so I wanna kind of do a little context work and then we're gonna kind of dig into chapter 12 just a little and then we're going to dig a little bit more into the beginning of chapter 13, but we're really going to focus on those last few verses of chapter 13, which is what our group time was really about 12 and 13. But I just feel like it's so important to kind of pull back. Now, context and the background story of Exodus, a lot of it you may know. Some of you might be like, oh, this is review. I already know this. But y'all, can I just tell you, I love to review. 
because I always hear something that I either forgot and, oh, I, re I really love that idea. I love that thought about that book. But also, I usually learn something that I didn't know. And especially if I'm walking through it with other people, they're always kind of, oh, that part of the story I had never really thought about. So don't look at review as like, ugh, like review day. I feel like this is just going to set us up. That we're just going to be walking through this book and have a lot of background that's good. So some that you may know, maybe you're listening for some things that you haven't heard. Um, I'm a homeschool mom. I teach my girls at home, and there's this curriculum called Drive Through History. It's like a real quick view of history, but we're really doing drive by history tonight. So it's even quicker than drive through. It's going to be pretty quick um, as we get into the book of Exodus and kind of talk a little bit about the backstory. So, um, context is about asking good questions. We're going to ask who, what, when, where, why, and how. Not all the time when you do context work in a book are all those questions always going to be answered. This one sets up pretty nicely because Exodus is kind of like a history book. I also happen to really love history. So. Um, so who wrote Exodus? You might already have discussed this in your group that Moses wrote the book of Exodus. He also wrote the first five books of the Bible. He was a busy guy. He had a lot of time in the wilderness to actually be writing these books. I love that Moses is the author because he's actually also in the book of Exodus and the book of Deuteronomy. And I think it's really cool to think about the fact that as he wrote these stories, he did not paint himself as the hero. If you've seen the um, Ten Commandments movie with Charlton Heston, you know, he kind of comes out as this larger in life hero guy. But Moses, as the author of the book, doesn't make himself look good. In fact, if you notice and you read him through the story, you're like, he actually could have made himself look a little bit better. You know, he really tells the truth about his feelings and the fears that he was feeling. And so I love that about that. Because here's what Moses knew. Moses knew who the book of Exodus was really about. Moses knew that Exodus is a book about God. It's not a book about Moses. It's not even really a book about the Israelites. It's really a book about God and his love for the Israelites and what he did in to redeem and rescue them. And so it's going to chronicle their journey through this, this wilderness. It's going to chronicle their journey from slavery all the way through to the promised land. Um, but Moses knew that this was a book about God first and foremost. So when does it occur? Now, I found out this fact. This was something I didn't know as I was digging and I was investigating the background content, is that in most Hebrew texts, like the original Jewish text, um, the book of Exodus starts with the word and. Has y'all ever heard that? I heard that. I was like, that's really cool. Why would the book of Exodus start with the word and? Like that would, the reason it's not in our English Bibles is that we hate that. Like you don't start a sentence with and. You can't do that, but it actually starts with and. It's because the first five books, which are called the Torah, um, were actually to be read in succession. And so they got done with Genesis, and they just said, and we're going to keep going. It just the story continued. So what is happening at the end of Genesis is that Joseph dies. Okay, And so Moses is born in the first part of the book of Exodus. And there is about 86 years between Genesis and Exodus. And so in that 86 years, Moses, you know, Moses is born 86 years later. And about the time he was born, um, Israel had been in Egypt or in affliction for 350 years. Okay? So that time frame traces back to the promise that God gave to Abraham when he promised him that he would have this land and they would he, he would bring his people there. Um, that Egypt is actually talking about the affliction. And I had that, I was so confused by all that because some of the time frames don't exactly line up, but you'll find these numbers also listed in other, other parts of scripture. So it holds pretty true, but it was, it's to point back, it actually dates back to Abraham, those numbers. So, so Joseph dies, Moses is born, um, and Moses is about 80 years old when the Exodus starts. So from the time that he's born, between he and Joseph, and then Moses is about 80 when the Exodus begins. So where does this happen? Well, we are going to go from Egypt to Canaan. Egypt plays a central role in the Old Testament. It's a very, very important part of the history of the Old Testament. And Canaan is interesting. It's this smallish piece of land that lies between the Mediterranean coast. And I shouldn't have a map, but I don't. Just imagine the map that Aaron put um, on the, hopefully you printed that out. 
Um, that Canaan um, is, uh, lies between the Mediterranean coast and the Sea of Galilee, the Jordan River, and the Dead Sea. Now, it changes its name throughout the Old Testament. In Genesis and Exodus, it's called Canaan. And later, after the Hebrew people are established, it becomes Israel. And then in the New Testament, it changes again, and you hear it called Palestine. So just even knowing that history that we're going to go that we're going to go from Canaan to Israel to Palestine all the same place. Okay? So what is Exodus about? Well, essentially it's about a departure. Moses is telling them the story while they're wandering in the wilderness. He's continuing to tell them their story. He wants them to know and he wants their children to know who God is and what he did for them. So that they will not forget. And again, over and over and over, we're going to hear, remember, remember. So they're walking and Moses is teaching. And I would assume as we get into the numbers game, he's probably gathered some leaders. And he's probably writing and telling the story because they, they shared all their, um, their history <coughs> orally. So he's probably gathered some of the men who were leaders. And then the men are going back and telling their family. This is how I imagine it. I don't, I don't know that that's, that's how I think it's. He's not talking to all the people at the same time because that would have been impossible. Um, so this is what's happening. So how did the exodus happen? Well, this is the, just the really quick history version. I'm not going to get into all the details. Um, but despite the slavery that the Israelites had been um, oppressed under, they thrived. Despite slavery, they thrived. And so Moses is born during this time. And we know, if you know the story of his mother, and I, her name is Jochebed, 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 I am a huge fan of this woman. What she did to save her little boy is just phenomenal. It's such a great story, and I wish I had time to talk more about that. But she basically, you know, the Pharaoh has decided that he's, he's getting really worried about all these Hebrews. They're thriving. They're multiplying. He's going to, like, he's going to put a stop to that. So he's going to kill all the little boys. Well, she refuses. She basically, she and her husband decide, we are not going to do that. We are going to save our son. And so she hides him for four months, and then she puts him in a basket. And I'm, I'm always so amazed that she literally puts him in the basket, in the water that she was supposed to kill him in. And she floats him by faith. She floats him down the river, and he lands in the hands of the man, the daughter of the man who wanted to kill him. I mean, God is so faithful. So Moses is actually adopted by the Pharaoh's daughter. He grows up in the Pharaoh's house. He lives under that, but he knows. He knows that he's not Pharaoh's son or his grandson. He knows that he is an Israelite. So you might know the story that he kills an Egyptian for killing a Hebrew slave, and he flees to the wilderness. So he's in this wilderness of Midian. Um, he's about 40 years old when he goes, when he flees to Midian. And God remembers, he remembers his people and he calls his people to remember. Again, we're going to talk about remember a lot. And here's what I love about Moses. Okay, God uses broken people to do his will. Moses was a murderer. Moses was a runner. Moses was hiding. He wasn't even where he was supposed to be. He was hiding. And God knew where he was. But God uses broken people to do his will. I love this quote. God has nothing to work with but sinners nothing to work with but sinners. Isn't that encouraging? You know, when he looks out, he didn't go, oh, well, that one's a little bit better than that one. He's, he's only working with sinners when he's working with people. So God calls Moses. Moses gives him all the excuses in the book. He's not going to do it. He tells him five times, I ain't your man. And here's why. God says, I am the man, <laughs> and you will do what I tell you to do. I'm going to do something that is going to just completely it's just going to be such an epic story, this is my translation, by the way, that no one's going to understand, but they will know that I am God. And so everything happens um, as God says it's going to happen. You know, the plagues, all the things are going to happen. And so finally, and this is the short version, Pharaoh is finally just devastated. He's like, fine, go. So who and how many are going out? And I know this was a question in your... Um, Reading, did anybody have that? Anybody remember off the top of their head? How many people? 600,000 men. Okay, so this, yeah, okay. So the conservative estimate is 2 million because you need to factor in women and children and the old people who apparently they didn't count at this point. 
and some extra stragglers who I think went, hey, they're leaving, we're going to. So the conservative estimate is two million. Now, I'm a visual person to the core, and I wanted to know what does two million people look like? Because I don't know, I need to have a visual. So y'all, in 2017, the population of Orlando, and I'm guessing this is Orlando proper, was around 200,000 people. So you take the population of Orlando and you multiply it by 10, right, math, math, mathematicians? By 10, and move them out of the state of Florida at the same time. Y'all, you think, I-4 or 75 is bad, oh my goodness. That was not a tiny group of people walking out. That was like a nation on the move. Two million people, that is a lot of stinking people. So this, uh, Max Anders says, this ranks as one of the greatest historical events in the ancient world. It was a nation on the move. It's pretty epic, right? It's pretty significant. Um, and what I love about it is that if you look in history books or even look at the movies, they don't even touch that. You can't even, you can't even understand that number, that massive number that God was rescuing. He was calling out and providing a place of, 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 of promise for them, and he was going to take these people out. So there's your quick history lesson. That's your context. That's where we are. We dropped into Exodus 12. Um, we dropped into Exodus 12, and it starts with the Passover, Okay. Um, and this Passover is instituted, and then and, and in 1229, we get the tenth and final plague, okay? Um, and we see this happening, and on that day, it says that very day in 1251, that the Lord brought the people out of Israel, um, out of the land of Egypt by their host. So they're leaving in chapter 12, and then in 13, we're going to start digging into some of the uh, detailed context that we've been studying. And it's almost like repetitive. I don't know if you guys felt this. So you read about the Exodus, you read about the plague and the thing, and they're leaving. And then at the very top of Exodus 13, 1, he starts talking about, he says, um, and the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Sanctify unto me all the firstborn, whatsoever openeth the womb among the children of Israel, both men and beasts, it is mine. And then he goes to this detailed description about redeeming the firstborn. So redeem is another very important lesson in the book of Exodus. And it must be very important because they're leaving Egypt. And he's talking about it. Hey, Moses, I know that 2 million people are on the move. But by the way, you've got to remember that every firstborn son that opens the womb is set apart, is sanctified to me. And you will set them apart. Not just the firstborn son. Every firstborn of the donkey, the lamb. Um, uh, you or uh, uh, you shall redeem it. All of these instructions that you shall redeem it. So when the Lord, he says, when the Lord brings them into the land of Ca the Canaanites, as he swore to your fathers, he says, set apart your firstborn, all of your animals, all your male firstborns, redeem it with a lamb. Um, redeem the firstborn of a donkey and your firstborn son. So he's given them all these details to redeem the sons, the firstborns. Then he goes into this word remember. And remember, um, the Hebrew word is Zakar, I'm saying, I think it is, which means remember, recall, record, make a memorial. So not only redeem, but remember. Don't forget to observe the Passover. So when God talks about remembering, he wants, he, what he's doing, it's not like he's forgotten. He hasn't forgotten his people. It actually means to take action. So when you're, when God is calling you to remember, he's not just saying, don't forget about me. He actually wants, when he calls us to remember in the same way, it's to remember and do something about it. And so God wasn't like, oh, yeah, I forgot about those two million people in slavery over there. He's actually saying, I remember I'm doing something about it now. This is what I'm doing, and I'm doing it now. So it's actually a call to action. So then he goes into the details of the Passover. And he says in 13.3, And Moses said to the people, Remember this day in which you came out of Egypt, out of the house of bondage, for by the strength of the hand of the Lord brought you out of this place. There shall be no leavened bread eaten. And then there's some more, and then drop down to eight. He says, you shall tell your son on that day, it is because of what the Lord did for me when I came out of Egypt. And it shall be to you as a sign on your hand and as a memorial between your eyes that the law of the Lord may be in your mouth. For with a strong hand, the Lord has brought you out of Egypt, and you shall therefore keep this statute at its appointed time from year to year to year to year to year 
every year you do this. And you will tell your son, and he will tell your son, and he will tell your son, and he will keep telling the generations. Um, great cross references, Exodus 2.24, and God heard their groaning, and he remembered his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and with Jacob. Exodus 6, moreover, I have heard the groanings of the people of Israel, whom the Egyptians hold us like, and I have remembered my covenant. God does not forget his people. This is when he took action. So he remembered his covenant. He, will, he was going to bring them out. He would deliver them. And the Passover was going to remind them of that. And he wanted them to tell their children this is how they would remember. So why were they remembering? Were they remembering, oh, yeah, that was a great thing that happened. We all lived and we plundered the Egyptians and we took all their gold and we did all these things. It was so amazing. It was so cool. Well, I have heard, and I really wish I remember who said this, and it's possibly K. Arthur. So we'll just go with it. That the, and I won't say all because that seems like risky, but many, most of the physical events that you see happening in the Old Testament have a New Testament spiritual parallel. I won't say all, we'll say many, we'll say K said it. I think that's probably fairly safe because I have studied with her for years. Um, but the point of the redeeming the land and the point of the Passover wasn't just um, to redeem the firstborn. I'm sorry. It wasn't just to redeem the firstborn. It wasn't just to remember what happened. <clears throat> it was because that was going to be their physical representation of a spiritual truth that they needed to know years and years and years later when God took his firstborn son and he consecrated him as the perfect Passover lamb. These events were to point them to Christ so that when their son, 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 is standing and sees the risen, the Christ on the cross, they would know, oh, firstborn, the redeemed, the Lamb of God. Like, they would get it. It was to point them to that. I love this commentary. Asbury commentary says, Exodus 12, 1 through 13, 16 deals with the implications of the 10th plague. This plague was significant not only because it finally prompted the Egyptians to let Israel go, but because it revealed the fundamentally spiritual nature of salvation. Passover and the consecration of the firstborn are both recognitions that the real enemy of Israel and the Hebrew race is death, and God conquered it. That's what it was all about for them. And in Christ, this would be ultimately fulfilled. They wouldn't need to redeem the firstborn son by the lamb anymore. They would have Christ forever and always as their redeemer. Isn't that amazing? Like, that's, that's what Exodus is about. That's what it's about. So now we get to Exodus 13, 17, where we've been studying tonight. Then I could go on and on. I love all that stuff. So this is our focus passage, and I want to just dial in a little bit and listen. One of my favorite things, and I don't think we do it enough, is to read scripture aloud to each other and just to listen. So there's such a value in just listening to the word. I was actually, I was getting ready for bed last night, and I had my, I don't have my phone in me, and I had on my version app, and I was listening to, um, Exodus 12, and my husband came in, he goes, what are you listening to? Because it's like, sounds so bad, you know, I'm like, oh, I'm listening to Exodus 12. He's like, oh, okay. So, it's actually literally listening to it on my U version app. There's like a little bitty um, uh, megaphone or something like in the top corner, and you can click on that passage and it'll read to you. And different versions have different voices, so if the voice is the you can just pick a different voice. Yeah, it's really great. So, I'm going to read this because this is kind of where we uh, have been camped today. Um, so, let's listen. And it came to pass when Pharaoh had let the people go that God led them not through the, the way of the land of the Philistines, although that was near. For God said, lest per adventure, is what it says, the people repent, and when they see war and they return to Egypt. But God led the people about through the way of the wilderness of the Red Sea, and the children of Israel went up harnessed out of the land of Egypt. And Moses took the bones of Joseph with him, for he had straightly sworn the children of Israel, saying, God will surely visit you, and ye shall carry up my bones away hence with you. So take my bones with me when you go. Uh, and they took their journey from Succoth, and they encamped at Etham in the edge of the wilderness. And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of a cloud to lead them the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light, and to go by day and night. And he took, oh, he took not away the pillar 
of the cloud by day, nor the pillar of the fire by night from before the people. So let's investigate and let's just kind of briefly talk about what is clear from this passage, um, where he led and why. God led them himself. Moses had taken them to the edge of the wilderness, but God himself was going to lead them through it. They needed to see that happening. He led them visibly, and I'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute. Um, God carved out a path that didn't take them the easier, shorter way, the most obvious way. Okay? He took them a different way. His way, although I'm sure they complained, <laughs> wasn't even one of the routes that the tradesmen took or the, the typical way. He was going to take them the long way, and it was for their protection. Um, they might have looked ready for war at that point, but you have to remember, these were not warriors. They were slaves. They knew hard labor, but they did not know how to fight. They never had to fight. They didn't have to defend themselves. Those slaves, they were protected, sort of. Like, they didn't fight for Egypt. They worked for Egypt, but they weren't warriors. And they were not ready for the Philistines. So God took them in a different route to purposely prepare them for some battles, he took them by the way of the Amalekites. And we will read a lot about the Amalekites as we keep going through Exodus. Um, and we'll read, I think also they're in Joshua and Deuteronomy. I mean, they're all over the place. The Amalekites are annoying people. But they can handle the Amalekites. They needed to grow. They weren't ready for the Philistines. If you remember who was a Philistine, the Philistines were big, scary, war. They were men. They were ready for battle. And the the Israelites weren't ready for that, so God took them a different way. I don't think I ever really thought about that, and I think about my own life, and when I think about the way I want to go with the Lord, that sometimes God may be saying, not that way that looks obvious, and that is for your protection. You're not ready for that. Another thing I've been thinking about, too, is how one wilderness prepares you for another wilderness, okay? So he was actually preparing them for a battle they would, they would engage in eventually, but they weren't ready for it. Um, I mean, if you think about it this way, you wouldn't send your preschooler to college, right? You wouldn't do that. Who would do that? That would not go well. They're not ready. They were slaves. They were like little babies. They were like little whiny baby preschoolers. They were not ready for the, this, this battle, which would have been, in some ways, the easier route. Also, which is just a little teaser for next week, is that his path was also for their enemy's destruction. We'll talk about that next week. So how did he lead them? He led them um, by fire and cloud. Um, fire was um, an emblem of divine presence. And it was this natural mystery associated with deity. Um, the light, though, of this fire was miraculous. And another theme, and this is something that I've been trying to do, and, and the word that I am chasing through scripture of late is glory. But I'll tell you what would be another really great word for you guys to chase through. Um, Exodus would be light. Look for the light. Um, I mean, we didn't study it tonight, and I didn't even mention it. When God came to Moses, he came in a burning bush that was on fire. Um, Israel had light during the darkest plague. Do you remember that? We didn't talk about that plague, but when it was darkness, it wasn't dark where the Israelites were. Okay? So this idea of light... There's a miraculous light that's surrounding these people already. Um, uh, the pillar of fire in which God made it him, manifested himself as the leader of Israel. So this light was magnificent. Um, later, we'll see light, um, the light at the birth of Christ. The angels lit the sky. What is Christ referred to as the light of the world? So there's light. It's very important. I feel like it must be very important to God. Um, we also see um, light at the transfiguration of Christ and um, also the light that engulfed Saul when he saw the risen Christ. So light is an important word. You can chase that through scripture. And, okay. um, the other way that he, he, he led them during the day was through the pillar of cloud. Also, pay attention to the cloud in the wilderness. The term cloud um, is, is 
with God is very frequent in the Old Testament. The presence of the Lord is often denoted by a cloud, or the glory of God is often talked about in a cloud. So there, there are words that were specific to God's presence. So with this visible display, they could be led by day or by night. They could travel as long as God wanted them to and then stop. And I read this book, and I don't have time to read it to you, but it's called Tears Up. If you guys have any little kids and you want to read them a book about this, is a fictional book about people that came out of Egypt. And I love this book, but the author talks about this in the book that they would like, is the cloud moving? Is it moving? Should we go? Oh, it's moving. And it was so obvious when they were to go, when they were to, make, make, to break camp and go. And so I just love this book, and I thought I could use it tonight, but I don't have time because 30-ish minutes wouldn't allow. <laughs> um, but during that visible display, it would be filled with God's presence, and it would um, dispel the darkness. Um, the wilderness that they were in was very dark. I, I don't know if y'all have been in the desert at night, um, but it's dark. It's dark. So this was, this was going to be filled with light. <clears throat> um, now, here's something else. It wasn't uncommon for tribes or groups <coughs> to be led by fire. Like, they would often have torches. That would have been common. But this fire was supernatural. Um, it was not man-made, and it was very obvious. And I think one of the things that so encourages me is that pillar did not depart. It changed, but it never left them. What they needed, when they needed it, God's presence was there for them. All right, I need my water bottle. That's okay. Um, okay, so here's a couple more cross-references that I think just is very descriptive of how God led them. Um, this is in Deuteronomy 32.10. Um, he found, okay, listen, listen to God's heart. This is um, Moses' song. So right, which we'll get here. I'm probably jumping ahead. I'm, pro- I'm probably telling you stuff about the last week. I'm not supposed to tell you. But at the end, um, when Moses is, oh, thank you. <coughs> at the end, Moses does a song um, before they go into the promised land. And he's still telling them where they've been with God and what God has done. And this is what he says of them. He found him, and that would be men, in a desert land. And in the waste howling wilderness, he led them about and he instructed them. And he kept him as the apple of his eye. Like an eagle that stirs up its nest, that flutters over its young, spreading out its wing, catching them, bearing them on its pinions, the Lord alone guided him. No foreign god was with him. This is Deuteronomy 32, 10. Uh, His song is in um, Deuteronomy 30. So this is what he did for his people. This is a Matthew Henry quote. He kept him, his people, as the apple of his eye with all the care and tenderness that could be. And from that malignant influences of an open sky and air and all the perils of an inhospitable desert, the pillar of cloud and the fire was both guide and guard to them. So this pillar and this fire um, had such purpose for them, and it led them well, and God cared for his people. One of the things that I think about in the wilderness is where else would you put two million people? Like, where can you put those people? The wilderness was, like, the only place they actually also fit. But God cared for them as the apple of his eye. He loved them well. And, and, and Moses, at the end, when he's singing the song over them, he's telling them, don't forget. Don't forget how God cared for you. Mm-hmm. So if you follow Israel all the way to the book of Hebrews, which some of you know is my favorite book of the Bible, um, over and over it says in the book of Hebrews, they did not remember. They did not remember. But God did. And God says in the book of Hebrews, chapter 13, 5, I will never leave you or forsake you. And God demonstrated that so beautifully in the pillar and the cloud. Spurgeon, Charles Spurgeon says that God's leading was glorious, useful, guide, and guard. And this is what God does for his people. He still does. So when I study scripture, um, I always study to know more about God. And I also really pray that God will bring me to a point in my study where I am just face-to-face with Jesus. 
Um, I really believe that as we study, we need to have moments of worship because worship is our response back to God. And so I want to study and I want to be moved in my heart and I want to respond in prayer. Sometimes it's song, not usually in the morning when my children are sleeping because I don't want them to wake up, but usually I really try to come to some sort of worship moment. And I gotta tell you, God did something for me. And I, I don't know how he's met you already. And I know that he <coughs> is, and he will continue to do so as you dig into this book. But God did something for me, and I had to share it with you. Um, I My word for the year is abide, A-B-I-D. Um, and God very clearly let me know that was my word. And so I decided I was gonna do, um, in my personal study, so I'm doing Exodus, and I'm also reading something else for my ministry, and so, but I wanted to have something personal, so I've been going um, through Psalms 91, because the word abide is in the first, second sentence. So, Psalms 91 is actually anonymous, it's, it's, it doesn't have an author, but many scholars believe that the author is Moses. And so, I thought, huh, that takes on a whole new meaning. If you know anything about Psalms 91. He who dwells, I just want you to listen to this as if Moses wrote it, what we've been talking about tonight. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust, for he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence, and I will protect him because he knows my name. And you will not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the destruction that wastes at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side and 10,000 at your right hand, but it will not come near you. Remember the plague, the death plague? It will not come near you. You will only look with your eyes and see the recompense of the wicked because you have made the Lord your dwelling place, the Most High, who is my refuge. No evil shall be allowed to befall you. No plague come near your tent, for he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. You will tread on the lion and the adder and the young lion and the serpent you will trample underfoot. All found in the desert, by the way. Because he holds fast to me in love, I will deliver him. And I will protect him because he knows my name. And when he calls to me, I will answer him. And I will be with him in trouble. And I will rescue him and honor him. And with long life, I shall satisfy him and show him my salvation. Now, I don't know if Moses wrote that, but doesn't that sound like something he would have been repeating over his own heart as he's dealing with these Israelites? Like, I can imagine, even if he didn't write it, he experienced that. And I just thought it was such a beautiful reminder to me that this is the heart of my father. Because, as we learned in Hebrews, he's the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Redeeming and remembering and leading us by his glorious light, we can trust him. So I'll end with this quote, because I think this is a great place to end. And I'm doing okay on time. 30-ish. Um love this quote by uh, Matthew Henry and also someone that I love to quote. Those who make the glory of God their end and the word of God their rule, the spirit of God their guide of their affections and the providence of God the guide of their affairs may be confident that the Lord goes before them as truly as he went before Israel. In the wilderness though, not so simply, sensibly, we must live by faith. So I hope that this week has been encouraging to you. Please know that we're praying for you. We are excited about where we're going, y'all. Next week is going to be my favorite week. Ugh, epic. Next week, I just know that you will want to come back. And you can still bring your friends. So it's not too late to invite other people here. So thanks for being here. Um, and that's, that's all we got. We love you.